Good seat, Phil. Good job, guys. All right, guys. To speak to you guys, um, like we talked about in the classroom, um, remember your manners and what we talked about, guys. If you have a question, raise your hand. He'll call on you. He's going to go through some uh, um, things that he's going to talk about. He's going to show you some videos that he also has. Um, it'll be a time for questions and things like that uh, that you can ask. He'll go over the parameters with you. Um, about the questions that uh, the type of questions that he wants, um, it's about an hour and ten minutes that we'll be in here. Okay, make sure you pay attention. The other thing is, guys, remember we don't want to see any of those cell phones or anything like that out. So make sure they're in your pockets and you're paying attention. Okay, they're all right. Yeah, the first class he said, "This is Officer Hickey." And I'm like, uh, no. Uh, I'm just gonna uh, real quick introduce myself to you guys. Um, I don't know how often you have police officers come and talk to you. You know, you never know what to expect. Uh, we're all a little off, you know. So, um, but I'm really here to talk to you about traffic safety today. Um, so, I'm Officer Hickory with the Albemarle County Police. I'm assigned to the traffic unit. Um, anyone have any idea how many officers the Albemarle County Police Department has? How many? More than that. Sixty. More. 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 A hundred. A little over a hundred. We have like 121 right now. Uh, that doesn't mean that there's that many out on the street uh, at any given time. We have about 70 cops that work the street, give or take. And of course, you probably have out at a single time, maybe during the day, 10 to 15 to 20, and then at night, sometimes as little as only seven or eight, plus a supervisor. Um, so out of those 121 officers, we have a traffic unit that's uh, five officers. Um, let me tell you how I got my start. Um, I was hired uh, the second time that I applied uh, with the Albemarle County Police in 2003. Um, then I went to the police academy. Um, the police academy now is like 18 weeks long, but at the time it was only 14 weeks. Um, I don't know what they've packed in the extra four weeks, but I'm sure it's uh, important. Um, so <clears throat> after completing the uh, police academy with flying colors, I'm sure, um, I uh, was assigned to uh, FTO, which is a field training officer program. And as a new officer, you are clueless, you know. You don't know how to be a cop. You don't know how to, um, what you can and can't do. I mean, you know what's legal and what's illegal, but, you know, being in the academy and being on the street is obviously different. So you're assigned an FTO, field training officer is an officer who uh, shows you the ropes, who mentors you, um, you know, shows you where the bad crime areas are, shows you, you know, where the bad traffic areas are, stuff like that. So you're assigned to a couple different field training officers for about 12 weeks, and once they feel that you've got it, um, they sign you off, and you're, you know, as long as they don't feel like you're about to go shoot somebody for looking at you funny or beat somebody in the side of the head. Uh, for no reason, they, uh, there's more liability than that. But they, they make sure that you can write a report. They make sure you can fill out a crash report. Uh, they try to make sure you've made a DUI arrest because that happens a lot around here. Um, and then once you're um, done with all your, your things that they have to check you off on, um, then you're released on your own, all by yourself, and you drive around the county and try to do some good respond to calls, and I worked um, on evening shift, which is like three in the afternoon to midnight. I worked that for about six months, and then I uh, went to midnight shift, where um, you're working like midnight to, or just before midnight to about uh, 8.30 in the morning, which is lots of fun. Um, it actually can be fun for a young single officer, you know, but uh, as you get older and your body starts to feel these late night hours, it's not always uh, the best shift. Um, some people love me, that shit. So once, uh, in 2008, uh, an opening came available for the traffic unit. I put in for it because I've always been enthusiastic about traffic enforcement, traffic safety. I've um, always been pretty good at, uh, you know, doing a crash diagram, stuff like that. So I, I was actually selected uh, for the position. Um, so what do you guys think uh, we do as traffic safety officers? Anybody want to take a guess at what our primary function is? Yeah. No, no, those are patrol guys who usually do that. All the traffic guys are on motor, uh, police motorcycles are in the game, so we get to do fun stuff. Of course, speed limit? Uh, yeah, that's that's one of the things. I mean, basically what we're out to do is, 
enforce traffic laws. So we want to create traffic safety to make the roads safer for everybody. Um, how many people here think that police have quotas? You know what a quota is? Yeah, a certain amount of Yeah, how many people believe that's true? Okay, you'd be right, but not in our county. Okay, is anybody else have any, uh, know, everybody know what a quota is clear on that now? Okay, so basically, um, you know, if you don't write a certain amount of tickets, you know, you get in trouble. And if you get in trouble enough, what happens? You get disciplined, you get fired, whatever. Um, larger agencies, something like Boston, Massachusetts, I know that they, I've been told by one of their officers that they have a certain amount of moving violation tickets they have to write in a shift. If they don't, then they can be disciplined. Um, but we don't do that in Albemarle County. Uh, number one, speeding and other traffic violations, the fines from that don't go to the police department. Um, it goes to a county general fund that could buy a new seats for the auditorium at Monticello High School. You know, it could be used for any kind of uh, county um, spending issue, whatever the county would, would deem appropriate to use it for. Um, so, and anytime I'm out writing the tickets because I saw somebody doing something really dangerous and I felt like it was important to take enforcement action. Now, being that we are the traffic officers, we certainly are expected that we're going to put out some tickets or else they might get sent to, to be an SRO or something. Which would be a great assignment. Um, so, um, that's a little bit about me. Um, been doing crash, fatal crash reconstruction uh, since 2008. I went to advanced sorry, basic crash reconstruction school, which is a two-week class um, in 2009, and then in 2010 I went to a one-week advanced crash reconstruction school. Um, they teach us how to get speed from skid marks, how to get speed from yaw marks. Uh, they teach about stuff about time distance, um, reaction time, perception reaction, stuff that you can use when you're putting crash back together. And it's amazing, and you'll see some of the stuff uh, I'm going to talk about. Uh, it's amazing what you can piece back together at a crash scene. So let me start with a, a video that uh, just kind of shows what I do on a daily basis. If I worked in Australia, of course, because this is uh, this commercial is out of Australia. Eight o'clock at night has blood and gore and gun violence and you name it, it's on there. Um, I mean, Family Guy is more offensive than this commercial. So, but in the United States, for some reason, we don't want to play PSAs and public safety stuff like this. I don't understand it, but I think that if we did, it might help uh, people wake up a little bit. So, I'll try not to blast you with the volume too bad, but just pay attention because it starts off with the. I'm going to check this out. Yep, no. Thank you for the ticket. I love getting a ticket. Has anyone ever had that happen? 
So uh, generally, <laughs> folks aren't too happy to, to be pulled over by the police because they got caught doing something they shouldn't have been. They got caught speeding. They got caught running a red light. They got caught doing something that they don't really see as that dangerous. But the reality of it is that it can be dangerous um, because things change out in the road in a, in a heartbeat. Um, so, show of hands again, who, how many people are, uh, actually have their learners and are driving now? It's not that many, okay. Um, when you guys are riding in cars, uh, is there anyone here, and I won't make too much fun of you, but is there anybody here that just doesn't wear their seatbelt? Just doesn't wear it. Okay, you guys all from Scottsville? Or what? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and can anyone give me a good reason that they don't wear their shoes? Okay, I'll go with you first. I think it's a computer seatbelt. I feel like I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't like it. You don't like it the way it's like you're wearing the rest on your shoulder? Yeah. Okay. I feel like I can I don't know. I drive better than I have seatbelt. Okay. Do you have a reason? Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, so seatbelt use is very important. Um, what do you think? Listen, I, there were 21 people killed in 2011 in Albemarle County in fatal motor vehicle crashes. Out of those 21 people, I think 88% that had a seatbelt available were unbelted. Okay? Um, I've worked a lot of crashes where people have been killed and they would have survived. The crash is absolutely survivable, but they get ejected, run over by their own vehicle, you know, Messed up stuff. Messed up stuff can happen when you're not wearing your seatbelt. Go ahead. In that video, was that somebody standing on the floor? Ah, it was a limp. Like a limp. Um, let me uh, show you guys this crash test video. It's a comparable 95 Lincoln Town car. All right, you get get a close up in just a second. Why didn't the airbag go off? It doesn't have one. That's a great question. Why didn't the airbag go off? Because there's sensors in the front of your car that's supposed to sense the. Okay. But if you're not wearing your seatbelt, your airbag control module says he's not belted, I'm not going to deploy the airbag because the airbag deploying into an unbelted driver's face can kill the driver. Okay, so if it detects that you're not wearing your seatbelt, you will not deploy the airbag because it figures you're better off eating the steering. <laughs> Even if you don't lift it, an SUV 
or a pickup truck because it's more higher center of gravity has more potential to roll. You guys all know that to be true and in fact and all that. Okay, so let me show you this uh, video of a rollover test done on a Ford Expedition with the unbelted <laughs> Person run over. You see him get run over? Block him. 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 Block I want cousin that thrown out the Chevelle. Watch it. Look at the guy giving it up. That one guy was like, Damn. Well, that's not what happened with real people. Look at that one hanging on. That one? Yeah, the one person's just going to go. That one guy didn't say anything. She didn't say anything. Because it, when it rolls, gravity takes everything. It don't matter. Yeah. That one guy didn't want to get out. So that was probably done about 45, 50 miles an hour, I would say. I mean, so not real high speed. Um, 40, 45 miles an hour, you can be ejected from a vehicle and roll over. Uh, if the vehicle is rolling over and you're un unbelted, um, there's a high probability of ejection if you're not belted. And then, because um, you saw that, how, how many, four out of five got ejected? And then the guy that wasn't ejected was banging around inside the car. I mean, wherever the vehicle is going, it's going to continue to go that way and everything inside of it. If you're belted, you're not going to be banging around inside the car and, and you're not going to be ejected. It just can't happen. Um, the, uh, the, the thing about being inside the vehicle and banging around the vehicle, you know, if you guys are riding in the car with your friends, you know, and let's say you've got a 20 year old driver, and you got three teenagers in the car, and one person in the back seat won't put on their seatbelt. Well, are you going to be that, that guy? that girl, it's like, dude, you're not wearing your seatbelt. Because a lot of times kids think, or teens, sorry, not kids, but teenagers think like the whole peer pressure thing, you know, like, well, I, I'm not going to remind them, they're going to think I'm a dork if I'm like, no, oh, wear your seatbelt, you know. <laughs> but the truth of it is that if you don't say anything, you're putting yourself in danger. Um, if you're got all these people in a vehicle and they're involved in a, in a crash where the vehicle slides sideways, strikes a tree, um, or the vehicle rolls over like that just happened. The one unbelted driver now becomes a threat to everyone else who's belted. So everybody else is saying in the car and in their seat and, you know, along for the ride basically, like a roller coaster or something like that. But that one dude or that one girl that wouldn't put on her seatbelt is now her body which is, you know, your average girl is like 130, <coughs> 130, 140 pounds. Your average guy is, in high school is probably like 150, 160. You know, average guy, I'm just saying. Um, and you take the speed and you add the, you know, the speed and the, and the mass and all that, and you've got some pretty serious um, damage that can be done by a human body. Um, this commercial, or PSA, or whatever you want to call it, it kind of deals with that. It's not the best one. Okay, so 
I mean, the night crash was kind of right. So until it hits something, like the passenger next to you, or it goes out the window and then gets run over. So I'm just trying to drive home, guys. You just even though you might be strong guys and young, you know, you can't fight the forces that are working these crashes. It's just nothing you can do about it except wear your seatbelt. Um, this, this one's pretty good too.
and you got cars whizzing by each other like 60 miles an hour plus. You know, your average speed is probably 65. And the only thing dividing you is a curve that high that's like a foot wide in some places. You think that's going to stop the car that's out of control? Absolutely not. But 288, you got this huge median between between the lanes. You got guardrails. You got um, like what they call a clear zone on the side of the road, where there isn't a tree that you could hit for like miles. And so, if you do happen to go off the road, you're less likely to slam into a tree at 70 miles an hour and you get killed. Um, so that's why it's very important that if you guys are going to be driving around here, especially these roads don't forgive. If you make a, I mean, everybody's going to screw up. Or you're all going to be involved in a crash at some point in your life, I guarantee it. Um, I don't care how good of a driver you are, you can't always do something about what the other people are doing, right? So, wear your seatbelt and don't go really fast because if you hit a tree and you run off the road, you overcorrect. Or you run off the road at the wrong time and you don't have time to overcorrect. And there's just a big tree right there. I mean, <coughs> If you're going really fast, it doesn't matter what you're driving, it doesn't matter how many seatbelts you have on, your body cannot survive blunt force trauma like that. Your aorta will separate and you will bleed out on the inside. And they probably won't know about it because they look like they're not. Um, why do you guys think that it's important to have, uh, or if you, if you agree with this or not, what do you think about the school zone, the reduced speed limit for the school zone? I mean, not in a bad way, but I, mean, I don't mind it. Well, I mean, I mean you, don't you can drive, so why, why do you need to slow down? It's like, you know, I understand that, that viewpoint. Pedestrian. Pedestrian, yeah, I mean, the, when the school lights come on, school's no. coming in, school's letting out, right? Why is that? So, pedestrians, right? Kids, okay? And not just always high school kids, little kids. So let me just show you a video about speeding in the school zone. You guys, who said they had a little brother or sister? Oh, I have. That's it? Anybody else got a little brother or sister?
mean, this stuff can happen and does happen right here in Alvaro County. And um, we've been fortunate that I don't think we've had a juvenile killed since, maybe it's, well, we had a couple killed in 2011. But, um, you know, hit by a car, I don't know that we've had that happen in a while. So, no, there was a 13 year one that was hit. But the bottom line is that you, there's a school zone speed limit for a reason. There's a speed limit for a reason. Why do you think it's 25 in, in neighborhoods, like Forest Lakes and stuff like that? Um, you know, because you got kids playing. Mill Creek, you know? Anybody live in a neighborhood that's got a 25 mile an hour speed limit? Because people walk, they walk their dogs, they push their babies, you know? It's people doing what they do. It's what the, makes the world go around. But, um, you know, if somebody's flying, you don't have the same reaction time. You're covering all the feet per second, and your average human reaction time, anybody know what it is? Perception reaction time. Four seconds. So you'd be like, oh, a kid, oh no, one, two, three, four, react. No, it's a little faster than that. It's uh, the average human being, they've done studies on this. Uh, somebody said two seconds? Yeah, you're close, it's one and a half seconds. One and a half seconds. That's your average uh, perception, human perception reaction time. Athletes and cops have faster reaction times, believe it or not. <laughs> the athletes usually have faster perception reaction times. Why? Because you're trained to, you know, when that football's coming at you, you gotta react, do something about it. But your average person that isn't an athlete or whatever, doesn't train hard, it's about one and a half seconds. So in one and a half seconds, if you're going 60 miles an hour, you know, it's going to be one and a half seconds before you break. Um, to better understand that concept, I have another video to show you. Are we going to watch the Nauvoo and the Keller Yeah, we can watch it. Our job is to reconstruct serious crushes and get evidence that may be used in court. That's what I do. Now this young woman landed here with serious head injuries. Following the huge force that threw her over six metres from the impact here. We can work out she was hit at 32 kilometres per hour by analysing the car and these time runs. So we started breaking here. I first saw her when he was travelling out at 65. But let's change one small thing. Now he's doing 60 when he sees her. And this time he hits her at only 5 kilometres per hour. She just have a bruised leg. And we'd never have been called to this incident. These uh, brief history on these, these TAC commercials that I've showed a few of. Um, Victoria, Australia is a province in Australia that is kind of the same size as Virginia. Same, similar population and similar ge geographical size. They were having about a thousand fatalities a year. That's how many people are killed in Virginia. About a thousand people are killed in fa uh, fatal motor vehicle crashes. And you're more likely to die in Albemarle County from a fatal motor vehicle crash than in Fairfax County. Per capita, yeah. So, Anyway, they, uh, they were having lots of fatalities. They, a lot of them were drunk driving related, just like an Alamo County. And then they decided to do something about it. Started playing stuff like this to reach people, to say, wake up, you know, people are dying. And, you know, you might see a story here or there in the newspaper, but nobody gets the big picture. <laughs> so they started playing these, and I think in 2011, I haven't checked the latest, latest stats, they only had 300 and something fatalities, down from 1,000 a year. I think that, I mean, this is just my opinion. <coughs> if I saw stuff like this on the TV, I think it might make me think about my driving a little bit. You know, uh, for some reason, it's just not in this country. So I'm hoping that, that you guys can see this, these kind of things and understand what it's really like out there and what can really happen. Chances are you're not going to be involved in a fatal motor crash. Chances are you will be involved in a crash at some point. And to increase your chances of survival, chances of
not being injured and things like that. This is why this is why I'm here. Um, in this commercial or this PSA where he talks about reconstruction, the stuff's real. Uh, he talks about analyzing the, the tire mark. <laughs> I can't do it, but you know, the, the mark on the, on the roadway from the skidding tire, you can get true speed from that with the pedestrian truck. Um, you can get true speed, which means the actual speed of the vehicle, from a yaw mark. Does anyone know what a yaw mark is? Anywhere a yaw is? A yaw mark is, what's that? Do you have a, I thought you had your hand. No, no, okay. So, no one has any clue what a yaw is. Okay, I wanted to, if somebody does, I want you guys to try to take a stab at it. Um, but basically, a yaw mark in, a, in crash reconstruction is if a vehicle is sliding sideways, but there's no brake input, so the wheels are still rotating freely, then striations and the, the weight of the, uh, the, the vehicle on the pavement and all that good stuff creates something called a yaw, a yaw mark. And by measuring that mark, we can get true speed from that as well. Um, of the handful of you guys that are actually driving, um, is anyone driving like their family car? Newer vehicle? Okay. Um, do you know what year it is? An eight? Okay. What? What kind of car? Oh, okay. Nice. Alright, what about you? Mine is 2008. 2008 what? Well, at least you can say at least you can say it was it's a Toyota Ford. Like I've heard that. Um, uh, basically, since like the early 2000s and on, and until today, and they're getting better and better. And uh, vehicles have had crash data recorders, the airbag control modules, and the power control modules, and the, the restraint modules in vehicles record crash data. So if you're Sleeping in the middle of me talking, Mr. American Eagle, right there, wake him up. I'm here for you, brother. If you don't want to be here, you can leave. It's disrespectful. Now it's on video. Um, so, basically, if any vehicle has uh, modern vehicles, and it's federally mandated now that they have the ability to have this, uh, or that they have this technology, you have. Um, the ability to get the, the speed of the vehicle and when uh, the airbags deploy, you have the ability to get whether the brake was on or off, um, whether the driver and the front seat passenger were belted or not. All those things up to like five seconds before the crash usually are recorded. So if you run off the road and you know, or if you want a red light, for example, and you T-bone a car going through the intersection and you're going like 20 over the speed limit, all that stuff's going to be in your vehicle. And, and the police can get a search warrant, download that data, and uh, be screwed. Not only will you be screwed from a criminal standpoint as far as reckless driving, involuntary manslaughter, aggravated involuntary manslaughter, but think about it from a civil standpoint. Wrongful death suits, nobody ever thinks of this stuff, but you're gonna go after every drop of money you got because you took their loved one away from them, or because my hospital bills are $100,000 because you hit me in the side. You guys seen those ads for like, let's settle this one, was it Martin Harrison? Mm. Yeah, so, from our high school. And she comes up to the light, there's two left turn lanes, inside, outside, they both go left. Um, and she's basically just, you know, she's in a hurry, she's trying, she's trying to get to school, whatever. And the light turns green for her to, to turn left, to go on to 29 from Forest Lakes. Well, there's a tractor trailer that runs the red light on the 29 northbound, and she doesn't look before she goes. Get a green light, but, and shoots out into the intersection because she's legally fine. She, she shot it, you know, she had a green light. What's wrong with that? But there's no brick walls that pop up when the other lights turn red. You know, if somebody run, runs the red light, there's nothing to stop them. And so this uh, young 16-year-old girl gets hit in the driver's door by an 80,000 pound tractor trailer going 55 miles an hour. 40, 40 tons. Because the ton is 2,000 pounds. So, do you think she lived? So you got a 16 year old girl that never got to go to college, never got to graduate high school, for that matter, never got to you know, get married, have kids, 
anything like that, her whole life is gone. The truck driver has to deal with the fact that he killed a young girl. Um, parents have lost, had to bury their kid. No parent should have to do that. I mean, it happens, but, but it's wrong. And everybody loses, and it could have been prevented if she had just looked. Was she doing anything wrong? It was a to go She did nothing wrong. Does that change the fact that she's dead? Okay. So when you're at an intersection waiting for your light to turn green, just take the time to check, okay? Because that way, if there is something blowing through the light, a drunk driver, they're everywhere around here. I just arrested a lady um, Thursday afternoon of last week. She was drunk as anything, falling over drunk. Four week old baby in the car. 5.30 in the afternoon, driving on East Rye Road, hitting the curbs and everything else. They're out there. They will kill you. Yeah, I mean, some people, they, I mean, trust me, social services is involved, you know, but uh, some people are so messed up on medication. They have things like, you know, and, and if any of you guys have these things, then, then don't take offense to it, but, you know, depression, bipolar, PTSD, um, she had postpartum depression, which is like SF, I don't know, but it's after you have a baby. So she claimed to have all these, and she's out on all sorts of meds and with a beer between her legs. And, you know, who does that, right? People do it. They're out there, okay? I'm just trying to, I'm not trying to scare you guys to death, you know? But be careful when you're driving because so many bad things can happen to you guys. And I don't want bad things to happen to you guys. I don't want to be peeling your body off the pavement. I don't want to be picking parts of your brain out of a telephone pole. I don't want to do that. I don't want to see you guys in that way. Um, that's pretty much, I think, all I had to cover today. How much time we got? This class is a little bit longer, so we've got about 15 minutes, but. Okay, well, that's perfect for questions. Yeah. Oh, you wanted to see that one video. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll play that real quick. Good. What he's taught, he wants to see this video Dave. of a crash test of a 1959 Dave. Bel Air. I guess you saw it up here on the screen, right? Versus a 2009 Chevy Malibu. Um, see, modern cars are uh, they're designed to crush. Why? Uh, the car to crash. What's that? The car to crash. Exactly. So the energy's got to go somewhere. If you run your car into a brick wall. The energy's got to go somewhere. It's going to be reabsorbed into the car. It's not going into the brick wall. It's going back into the car. Anybody see the Mythbusters where they crash two cars oh, together, yeah. like 50 miles an hour, and then same damage happened at 50 miles an hour into the brick wall? Well, the, so the crash forces gets reabsorbed into the vehicle. Well, the newer cars, they crush. They crumple. They have crumple zones. You guys have all heard these terms, right? Older cars, you know, you all heard the term old cars are tanks and they're huge and, you know, like big boats of cars we had back in the 70s and 80s, 50s, 60s, just huge American automobiles. They don't make cars like they used to. You get, you know, you get in a Kia Soul, one of those hamster cars, and, you know, the bumper falls off if you hit a fire hydrant at two miles an hour. Okay. So, does anybody in here have a hamster car? All right. <laughs> Yeah, it's got a spark My brother got a 1978 so, uh, Anyway, so let's watch this video. You can see how technology crumbles on the airbags and seatbelts. The 59 Bel Air only has a lap. That's the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. Front crash of a 2009 Chevrolet Malibu and 1959 Chevrolet Bel Air. In slow motion, you can see the differences in how the new and classic cars perform in this version of the traditional frontal offset test. The Institute conducted this test to commemorate its 50th anniversary. It dramatically shows how much improvement has been made in passenger protection since the nonprofit organization opened its doors. The two cars collide in an explosion of metal, glass, and plastics. Where the Malibu crumple zone absorbs much of the crash force is ahead of the windshield, the Bel Air structure allows the wider car to compress the passenger compartment. The impact is made worse for the Bel Air driver, 
by flying with airbags, head restraint, and even a seatbelt. As a result, injuries to the neck, chest, and both legs would be likely. Consequently, the Bel Air receives a poor rating across the board. On the other hand, the modern Malibu provides good protection, with the dummy movement being well controlled. Measures indicate a low risk to most body regions, though a foot injury would be possible. Beyond the safety gear, advancements in vehicle engineering give the Malibu a clear advantage in this matchup. While classic cars are often considered to be rock solid, this 59 demonstrates how much better today's cars are. And the IHS has played a key role in driving these advancements. In the past 50 years, the Institute has made a real impact. The roads today are safer for it. Okay. Does anyone know where the insurance institute for Iowa Safety Crash Center is? Yeah. 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 All right, so um, you guys, I want to give you some time to ask questions. You really can start some interesting discussion. We got how much time now? About 10? Yeah, about six or seven minutes. Okay. All right, so just try to keep the traffic safety related. Anything we talked about today, something like that. Um, and uh, know how many times you had to pull your gun and stuff like that. I just have one question. I just, uh, you see, so with seatbelts, like if you be in an accident, like say if I was to run into another car, like I would be safe, like nothing bad would happen, like no accident to my face, my, my body if I would like to, like nothing severe or permanent if I were wearing my seatbelt. Right. 100% of the time, like 99.9%. .9%. I mean, there's always going to be that free crash where something, like if you, rolled your vehicle and you had a, a vehicle with weak roof strength, then the roof could crush and you could mess up your noggin that way, you know. But you're absolutely more likely to ha keep that pretty face if you wear your seatbelt. The chances are, are way, way in your favor. Absolutely. That's it, really, guys? Come on. That's a good question. Who's been in a really bad crash, anybody? Hey, actually, I've been in a crash. Can you tell us about it? Uh, me and my mom were going towards K Tech and the car support after I was. Yeah. I didn't get hurt. Oh, why do you think she got hurt? Because she's short. Shorter. Did she have her belt on? Yeah, she was just closer. Uh, she sits closer to the seat yeah. belt or the steering wheel? Okay. When I was in uh, Virginia Beach, we were driving in Chesapeake. And then there was a van, and it was like flipped over, and that van was like, the smoke was coming out of it and everything. Like, no, I wasn't involved. I was saying I saw it. <laughs> Have you ever had to tase anybody? Did you miss the don't ask me anything about